Right now, I'm in the middle of renovating this 80-year-old two-car garage, with the idea being that I'll end up with a killer workshop for all my projects. Over the past year and a half, I have spent countless hours and thousands of dollars making this happen. But as of now, that's all for nothing, since I can't even get a project in here. Neither of these garage doors can open. So today, I'm going to do the only logical thing, and tear down the entire front wall. I promise this makes sense. Because not only will I tear it down, but also build it back better than ever, and ideally, not die in the process. Ow. This should be fun. In a previous video, I installed a ridge beam in here so that I would be free to tear down the rafter ties and maximize headroom. But doing so meant removing the horizontal sections of the garage door tracks, rendering the doors inoperable, and forcing me to work outside. Which is where weather is. The specific reason these doors haven't been able to open for the past eight months is that the hangers for the tracks that were attached to the rafter ties are just much too short to reach the new, higher up collar ties. But after months of deliberation, I finally figured out a solution. Longer hangers. But there's a problem. I only purchased enough material to hang one garage door. So if you think about it, it only makes sense that I ditch the two 8-foot doors and replace them with a single 16-foot door. And that's going to require tearing this whole thing down. Now you may say, Ronnie, a conversion like this is an insane amount of work and isn't really worth it. And I may say, hey, we don't talk about that. In reality though, the only benefit two 8-foot doors have is the wall between them, which just gives you extra room to open your door when you have two cars parked inside. But this garage is not for parking two cars in, but instead for being a workshop for one car at a time. Not only will a 16-foot opening allow me to power slide into the garage like a badass, but it also means there will only be the two outermost garage door tracks, freeing me of the middle ones that would otherwise obstruct the vertical space I just worked so hard to get. But the biggest reason is that this wall needs to be rebuilt anyway. Hi. The headers above the openings are either way undersized or even non-existent, some studs are bent comically out of shape, and the majority of the sill plates are completely rotting away. And plus, I kinda already spent the $700 on the lumber to make this happen, so... Before I go and tear down the entire wall though, I first need to extend the concrete stem wall 8 inches on both sides of the building. Because if I want the new opening to be exactly 16 feet wide, I have to make up the difference from the space originally occupied by the stem wall that was between the original doors. After marking out where the extension is going to be, drilling some very large holes, and doing what I'm only allowed to show over on my Patreon, I used some industrial grade epoxy designed specifically to anchor things into concrete, to anchor some things into concrete. This new anchor bolt and rebar will not only act as a structural skeleton for the new section of the stem wall, but they'll also mechanically lock it to the existing foundation. As far as the actual concrete work goes though, I honestly considered hiring this job out. The idea of getting something wrong and risking a failing foundation was very daunting, but when the cheapest quote I got from the few contractors actually willing to do a job this small was $530. Uh, yes, that is correct. Doing it myself actually didn't seem that bad. And honestly, it wasn't. The hardest part was just making sure I had the forms level again after I pulled them off to apply a concrete bonding adhesive, but pouring the concrete was pretty straightforward. It's just a matter of tossing it in, vibrating it down, and leveling it out. And of course, doing the same thing for the other side. I wasn't totally confident about my ratios, but after three days of curing, they turned out pretty good. They can at least hold me up. Now these still have to cure for a full week before they're strong enough to build on, so because I have to wait anyways, I can go ahead and use this time to fix another problem. I showed earlier that rainwater pooling in the driveway can be annoying, but it's also proven to be a lot worse than just annoying when it gets severe enough. Yeah, that's not ideal for workshops. Eventually, I need to install some type of drain out front, but to do at least something about it now, I figured it might be a good idea to also pour a tiny concrete wall at the base of the doorway, though not before chipping away and repairing this crack with a specific crack filling product. 
You know, I've also got a specific crack filling product for your mom. Not only will this be a barrier against intruding water, but because the ground wasn't exactly level before, it'll also create a raised uniform surface for me to install a brand new sealed door onto. But first I gotta tear down this entire wall. Yeah, somebody worked really hard on folding those pieces of trim to fit there. It's too bad they're shit. might seem pretty quick in the video, but tearing this wall down was an insane amount of work. And during this process, I unfortunately made a few upsetting discoveries. One, I am completely out of shape. It's fucking heavy. Two, the rotted out sill plates go further than just the front wall, which looking back to the first workshop video shouldn't be too surprising. And three, the concrete barrier for the doorway did absolutely nothing for holding back water. So that's fun. There is actually a fourth thing, but it's just a little one. And uh, that is that the entire building is about to collapse. I wish this was a joke, <laughs> but it's not. You see, while I was resting after all that work and just staring at the now exposed entirety of the garage, I noticed something truly horrifying. I very quickly grabbed my laser level and sure enough, the entirety of the right side of the building is leaning out almost an inch and a half from where it's supposed to be. I then checked the other side, and it was the exact same thing. So if both walls are leaning, that means the entire building is leaning to one side. This isn't a garage. It's a garage. And that is because this building has no shear support whatsoever. The outside sheathing is made up entirely of horizontal boards, and horizontal boards don't really do anything for lateral stability. Now obviously structural OSB panels didn't exist 80 years ago back when this place was built, but the problem could have still been avoided if they were to have simply just incorporated some kind of diagonal bracing. But they didn't. So not only is this building inherently at risk of falling over, but I just made it much worse because I tore down one of the two walls that was supposed to be bracing it in the direction that it's currently leaning. But that's okay, because I'm gonna fix it. Now, it was a little bit sketchy, but what I did was pull the building back into position with a couple of ratchet straps. It should go without saying that these are way undersized for what I'm asking them to do, but somehow, it still worked. They pulled not only the front wall straight, but the back wall too. Well, almost straight. Honestly, it needs to go another quarter of an inch or so, but I don't want to risk snapping these straps, so for now, I'm gonna call that good enough. And I'm gonna get on with the rest of the work. For posterity's sake, I not only replaced the original concrete anchors with new ones, but also added enough for there to be two for each section of the stem wall. I then finished up the last bit of foundation work, and that was squaring up and filling out the edges of the doorway with fast setting concrete. This was to make the middle stem wall section the exact same width as the sheathing that I'll be using. Well, it's a little more than four feet. That's okay. The other edge of the opening was already pretty square, but in order for it to be the specific size I needed it to be, I still had to add in a bit more concrete here too. It wasn't exactly a difficult task, though it probably would have been a lot easier if I hadn't accidentally tilted the form at an angle, making it so the sill plate can't sit flush with the surface, because that made me go into a panic and smash the thing with a hammer, where I only realized after reforming it by hand that it would have been much simpler to have instead just contoured the wood to fit the uneven surface. I promise this makes sense. Now before I permanently install the sill plate that I absolutely just failed to drill straight down into. It took an eighth of an inch off. I totally drilled at a super huge angle on both of these. I want to first lay down a sill sealer. This is to prevent the wood from soaking up any moisture if the concrete were to become saturated with water. It might be a little overkill given that there's already the stem wall to raise the sill plates off ground level and the fact that I'm using ground contact rated pressure treated lumber. It's not going anywhere. But when it comes to taking steps to avoid the wood from rotting out in the future, it's never a bad thing to be redundant. 
And more than that, it's never a bad thing to be redundant. I of course added in brand new sill plates on the other two sections, but before I start adding in studs, I wanted to see what a third ratchet strap would do. These are all still way undersized, but... That looks pretty good to me. So the building might be level side to side, but the roof line is still anything but. By some miracle though, I actually had the foresight to attach the collar ties with screws on this side of the roof, specifically so that the rafters will be free to pivot about the ridge beam as I level this out. From there, it was just a matter of cutting the studs to length, nailing them in place, and repeating that process a few more times until we got ourselves to the beginning of a properly built wall. But it's not good enough just yet. I say beginning because it hit me that the front of the garage is gonna be 80% door. So even though I did buy structural sheathing to hold the walls square and steady, ow, right at my fucking toe, there isn't exactly gonna be a lot of wall for the sheathing to go onto. So to maximize the stiffness of the minimal wall there is, I also installed a diagonal brace. It's very possible it's superfluous, but that is better than the alternative. From there, I finished the framing for the doorway, which I thought would be fun to build twice. Is that right? Wait a minute. I made the opening 80 inches big. The door is 80 inches tall. Oh my god. But once that was fixed, the biggest challenge was installing the beams that spanned the 16-foot opening. However, it wasn't as difficult as it otherwise would have been if I hadn't installed the ridge beam. Before, the entire weight of the roof was shared between the two walls on either end, but since I opted to nix the rafter ties in favor of supporting the ridge directly, 50% of the roof load now goes directly through the center posts that support the beam, leaving the outer walls to each bear only 25% of the total roof load. A typical building this size would have required 11 and 7 8 inch LVL beams, but I was able to get away with using shallower 9 and a quarter inch beams. However, I did still have to remove the lower half of the top plate in order for the beam to be high enough for the opening to be exactly 7 feet tall. But with the beams being shallower, that also means they're lighter weight, and I can install them all by myself. However, they are still very heavy. Ow. That could have been bad. That could have been bad. Though once I jacked up the sagging roof so that there was actually room to install the beams, it was smooth sailing. Holy shit, that was exhausting. I still gotta do that one more time. At this point though, I thought I would have been more excited to see the entirety of the framing done, but honestly, I was stressing out. I think I shot myself in the foot. <laughs> oh. I completely overlooked the fact that the ratchet straps are right in the way of where the sheathing needs to be. So in order to install the things that are going to hold the building square, I have to first remove the things that are currently holding it square. The best course of action is to work my way backward, making sure to remove a ratchet strap if and only if a structural panel was just installed first, meaning the wall should be as braced as it's gonna get by the time the last strap is removed from the middle. With the diagonal brace, the sheathing installed and the other two ratchet straps that are still on over there, the top plate and the entire roof should not move when I release pressure here. Or at least, that's the idea. Wait, hold on. Well, the carport definitely moved, but is the wall still good? I mean, the bubble's still between the lines. So that's good enough for me. Honestly, even if it is a fraction of a degree off, it's still way less than it was, and the building is now actually properly braced. Or, at least one wall is. But in order for Gizmo here to stop coming inside the garage at night and peeing on literally everything he can, 
I'm going to need to install some doors. And I had the choice of buying whatever door I wanted, but for some reason, the cheapest one stood out to me. Before I permanently install it though, I want to address the water issue once and for all. I can only assume that it has something to do with all the cavitation along the bottom edge. So I slathered on some more fast setting cement, but this time with an acrylic fortifier added in, which should reduce water permeability. And it just so happened that it started raining later that day, and I can confidently say, it did not work. But actually, it did. Enough time just hadn't passed for it to finish curing, because the next day, after giving up and moving on to just installing the door, it was actually holding back water. It's wet where the door dripped, but that's it. Now you may say, Ronnie, isn't the light switch going to be a problem now that you have a right hand in swing door which completely covers it? And to that I say, what the hell are you talking about? The light switch is right there, where it's always been. Are you okay? Now, it wouldn't make sense for me to create a 16-foot opening if I didn't also get a 16-foot door to fill it. Lucky for me, sketchy people on Facebook Marketplace exist who will sell a used one for a third of the price of a brand new one. I mean, sure, a few areas were completely mangled and I had to drill out the brackets and reform the metal by hand, but it's totally good. Before it goes in though, I had to first install some 2x4 blocking around the perimeter of the opening so that the garage door tracks have something to bolt onto, and then some PVC trim around that so that the door has something to sit against. Unfortunately, installing the trim with screws leaves a bunch of unsightly holes. But un-unfortunately, the trim screws came with what is possibly the worst candy in the world, but they sure do fit the holes very well. With the money I saved from buying used panels, I decided to splurge on brand new hardware. I was confused at first why this didn't come with instructions, but then I realized these are probably usually installed by people who actually know what they're doing. But once I figured out you have to have both tracks in place, it was just a matter of stacking the panels, locking them to the tracks by attaching the rollers, and screwing on the hinges. But it was at this point something hit me. No, uh, not that. Something about the door didn't look right. A tiny little gap there. But a much bigger gap here. Did I build this side of the wall taller than that side? Well, technically, yes. I measured and it's about an eighth of an inch taller on this side of the building, but the reason that the difference is so big is because the concrete is actually sloping down. It's about half an inch higher on the right side than it is on the left side. So the opening is actually fine, it's just the door that's... While that is very annoying, it's technically not a problem. As long as I raise the lower side track off the ground half an inch, everything will still be perfectly in line with each other. From here, I can install the last of the rollers, finally install these longer hangers, and add in a support brace along the top edge of the door so that it sits uniformly against the trim. And the only thing left at this point before this door is operational is installing the torsion spring. But I'm not gonna do that. Sammy is. Now, I've done some pretty dangerous stuff in my time, like building that DIY brake drum resurfacer made from an old bench grinder. However, there have been zero reported deaths due to DIY brake drum resurfacers made from an old bench grinder. The same cannot be said for garage door torsion springs, because these things carry a lot of force. Sammy was no stranger to that, because he has a scar from when one snapped loose, broke apart, and impaled itself into him. These things are scary. Luckily though, there was no such trouble with mine, and for the first time in over 8 months, I had a functional garage door. And for the first actual time, this building can finally be a proper workshop. Oh yeah, there's still that thing.
Wait, hold on. I bought a hammer drill. Why am I not using that? Okay, so with that gone and new concrete added over, now I'm done. Now, obviously, there's still so much more to do. There's no insulation, inadequate electrical work, and of course, the rotting wood. But I have a wall that's not on the verge of collapsing, and I have a functioning door. Thank you for watching. Thank you to those who purchased the new Ronnie's Automotive t-shirt I debuted in the last video. And now please, get out of my garage.